morning. Uh, first of all, obviously, thank you for coming. Um, this is our sixth uh, breastfeeding session for 2017, and we're really excited to have Dave Donnan with us this morning. Uh, Dave is a senior partner based out of our Chicago office, uh, and he leads our food and beverage industry sector globally. So we've done some really interesting work uh, in the last six months around uh, consumers, uh, but I'll let Dave introduce himself and introduce uh, this particular interesting topic. Thank you, David. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Dave Donham. From, I'm Canadian. I live in Chicago. I've uh, been in the last two weeks here. I've been uh, in Auckland last week speaking at a large agricultural conference. I was in Sydney at the beginning of the week uh, speaking at a bunch of groups and then here today. So Auckland, Sydney, Melbourne, which is the best? Just to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it should be obvious, right? Exactly. So. So thank you. So um, my background, I've been in the food and beverage industry my whole career. Started off as a plant engineer and an industrial engineer, was a plant manager, ran manufacturing facilities and supply chain, uh, got into consulting, got out of consulting, uh, ran, I was a president of a technology company that supplied technology to the food industry and to the retail industry and now with A.T. Kearney for the last 15 years. A senior partner, which basically means that I can turn all the work over to people like David to do and uh, I, I'm going out more as a brand ambassador to, uh, to uh, around the, the world. Um, run a, a group of a food and beverage consultants in A.T. Kearney, about 100 consultants that focus just on the food and beverage industry, everything from uh, the details of supply chain and procurement to the, the marketing, branding, expansion, etc. Um, but we're also part of a larger consumer products uh, practice, which um, we're going to talk about today in some of the research we've done, which uh, really looks at these things of Amazon, Alibaba, and millennials. So first question, how many millennials in the room? Okay. Second question, how many wish they were millennials? <laughs> I, I want to have some avocado toast and <laughs> kibbacha and an uh, organic uh, smoothie, so. Uh, but yeah, so the whole issue is not millennials, it's around a shifting culture, a shifting communication, a shifting set of values that all consumers are going through. So that's what we're going to talk. So over the next uh, 40 minutes or so, we're going to go through the analysis, the, some of these points you'll agree with, some of them will be obvious to you, and some you'll disagree with, and that's fine. If you have any questions, please come forward and uh, we can get a discussion going as well. So if you look at the last probably 50, 60 years, our consumer society is based on three key principles. Affluence, seduction, and scale. Is there a little laser pointer on this thing? Yes, there is. Woo, look at that. Perfect. Affluence, seduction, and scale. So what do those mean? Affluence is we all wanted to be better than our parents as far as our lifestyle. We're all striving for middle class or upper middle class. And so affluence meant more buying more things and having more wealth and having better lifestyles. Seduction is how the brand marketers got us by um, taking us and persuading us and seducing us to buy this product. This will make you look better. This will make you feel better. This looks good on you, etc. So our whole brand marketing has been a push marketing to seduce us to buy their products. And then finally, scale. You had to have scale to do these things. You had to have a marketing engine, a marketing department. You had to have the advertising budget. You had to have big factories and big manufacturing and large supply chain and big trucks. So scale, seduction, and affluence really defined how our consumer society has come about. This is changing now through technology in a variety of ways that we'll explain in a minute. Right now, the three principles are trust, influence and personalization. Trust about how we interact with each other. Influence rather than persuasion is about how we influence each other and then personalization about how it impacts me. We're going to go through each one of these in more detail and give you some of the research behind it to show why we believe these are the three sort of tenet principles behind some of the consumer interaction and the changes that are going on right now. The result of this is a massive change, okay? We're seeing consumers going from what I own to I am what I do. Think about a food purchase. We used to buy a product. We bought it for what it is. Now we buy it from where did it come from and how was it made? And so this conversion from what I own to what I do is an important one. Consumer drivers from value to values. So we're moving to that 
affluence to influence model. We're moving from value of the product to values. Is it sustainable? Is it environmentally protection? Does it help my community? Is it local? Relationship. Whoops, sorry. Pushed the wrong button there. Relationships. Transaction based, based on buying something, to trust based, based on actually interacting with something. Business models that were static. Now, they're very dynamic. If you look at any corporation, how many times do you go through an organizational change? How many times do we adapt and change uh, leadership roles? The marketing segmented to much more personalized. We're seeing that, in the, and we're going to go through several examples on that. And then the need to understand. I, I, the premise I give to you is the days of big trends are over. What we're seeing is the signals. We're seeing triggers that are going on. And the, and the trends may be much faster. They peak quickly and they die quickly. But we're looking for triggers of changes in influence and changes of how the consumers are acting. And that's kind of what we have to as collectively look for. What are those trigger events that are important to each one of us in our brands? Why? Well, here's, here's kind of the, the ba basic data behind this. So why are these three um, assumptions, these three principles uh, uh, important now? And why are they going forward? Really because of demographic shifts are changing values and the hyperconnectivity. And, and let me kind of dig down at each of those and show you and sort of build up the, the fact base behind all of this. So how did we do it? Well, in this beginning of the year, we did a consumer survey of 7,000 consumers across seven countries. The countries were United States, France, United Kingdom, Germany, India, Japan, and J China. And we interviewed um, across multiple cohorts. In fact, we interviewed people from the silent generation, the people that actually experienced World War II. And if you look at this, this is in 2027, there'll only be about 100 million of the silent generation left at that point in time. Boomers, which I'm part of that cohort, uh, there'll be about a billion left um, in 2027, in, in 10 years. Generation X, which I'm sure most of you are part of here, uh, will be about 1.4 billion. Millennials, 1.9 billion. And then we haven't even talked about Generation Z. Uh, and, and, you know, 2.3 billion. This is, this is our, our children born in the year 2000 and forward. You know, the oldest now are 17, going on 18 years old, entering college. These are the true digital natives. They never knew a rotary phone. They never knew life without a cell phone in their pocket. They never knew what it, what it was before an iPad or before online ordering and those types of things. So true digital natives are Generation Z. And then coming right behind them, being born now, or the, we haven't named it yet, but the alpha generation. I mean, this is, they're, they're going to be even different because they will actually see physical augmentation and digital augmentation. You know, whether it's going to be through enhanced eyesight or enhanced hearing, whatever. There's going to be a shift, in, and, and in fact, one of the uh, kind of stories and jokes people tell is that this is part of Homo sapien version 2.0. Because it now represents our memory, it, remembers, it represents our guidance system, remember, it represents our communication systems, and ultimately this will expand further and become much more integrated into what we are. So we put this survey together, you know, against these cohorts, against those nations, and really started to see are there those trigger points? Are there those things that are affecting us all around? So what we found that were fundamentally similar, what were the same? Bigger. Every one of the countries that we looked at is getting bigger population. India, China. The U.S. is getting bigger due to, due to immigration. Uh, the U.K. is getting bigger slightly. Um, the only two countries that are not getting bigger are Japan and Germany, of the ones we surveyed, and they're depopulating. They're actually having a less. And the idea is that you need to have at least 2.2, statistically, 2.2 children per, per woman of childbearing age in order to replenish the population. And Germany and, and uh, Japan, Germany, Japan, Italy, Russia, Greece are all below that level. So, um, so we're getting bigger. We're getting older. Again, people are living longer due to medical science and better nutrition. And millennials have had less children. We're having less children as a population generally. And so we're seeing an older cohort. More diverse, the diversity in cultures. People are moving around the world. We're seeing more diversity in, in cultures and thinking and lifestyle, which leads to le less traditional types of family. 62% of households are now singles and couples, not husband, wife, or spouses with children. Why? Two largest cohorts right now are boomers and millennials. 
Boomers are, going to, are now becoming empty nesters. And millennials, again, have postponed marriage and children. So a lot of the shopping patterns now are being driven by singles and couples. More unequal, we're seeing that bifurcation of income. The rich are getting richer, the poor are not going anywhere. And the middle class has kind of eroded. And that's an issue politically, social, economically. And more urban. 62% of the world population are urban now. It's going to go up to about 80%. People are living in cities. That's where the infrastructure is going to be. A friend of mine once coined the phrase, we're becoming, we're becoming a society of gudos, G-U-D-O. Graying, urban, diverse, obese. 750 million people in the world are hunger deprived, starving, nutrition, or, or you know, lack of food. 1.5 billion people are overweight and obese. Hunger is no longer the issue in the world. Nutritional deficiency is. And nutritional deficiency can be in malnutrition or can be in obesity. People get fat because of poor nutrition as well as people uh, starving. So these are issues that we're now facing and that are going to get even more manifest as we go forward, as we go to a 10 billion population in 2050, as we see 3 billion new consumers, middle class consumers come online in China and India in the next 15 years. So the first one is trust. Steve Jobs, CEO of Apple, was, had the best comment, which is a brand is simply trust. And think of a brand. A brand represents quality, it represents integrity, it represents taste, it represents whatever, but it's a trust mark between you and the product. And so that trust is something that's inherent in everything, in every transaction, every sale, every consumer product we look at. But trust has eroded. Any of you, if you go online, look at the Edelman, E-D-E-L-M-A-N, 2017 Trust Barometer. Every year they look at trust around the world. Who trusts who? Guess who's on the bottom of the trust list? Politicians, <laughs> government people, but also big business. Who's at the top of the trust list? Teachers, doctors, and your Facebook friends. <laughs> That's where you go for information. So if you look at how that happens, who has the, what has the greatest impact on society? And you look at the green is my voting decisions, and the taupe or grayish is my purchase decisions. More people think their purchase decisions have an impact on society than their voting decisions. I can change society by what I buy, not on who I vote for. And we're seeing this go around the world mm -hmm. in elections. I buy more sustainable food. I buy environmentally friendly food. I don't buy, I buy product without GMOs. I buy product that is, uh, is cruelty free, that cage free eggs, whatever. Those are how I'm making my personal decisions made is through purchase decisions. And if, what, in, and if you look at it, millennials have the most 40%, Generation X 48%, and boomers are still small, but, but you know what? <laughs> As I showed in the previous start, they're going away. So, that impact of personal decisions, personal purchasing on societal impact is real. And uh, you know, it's having an impact. If we looked at across uh, different countries, we said is, you know, percentage of respondents with little or no confidence in large corporations. Look at UK, France, US, Germany. Over 50%, all of them. China and India are different than they actually, China, the consumers, and India consumers trust brands mostly local brands, but brands still represent, in China, food safety in many cases for food. And in India, there's still a, a, a strong connection with brands for status, for middle class, for other things as well. So they are you know, more trustworthy, India and China, than the rest of the uh, uh, North American and European nations, but um, it's, it's eroding as well. If we look at the, the brand versus price, we can see here that Again, percentage of respondents who care about brand rather than price. You know, so people care more about price in Germany, UK, Japan, France, more about brand in India and China, so kind of the reverse. But we're seeing that erosion where, where brand integrity, brand loyalty has eroded over the last decade. Price, you know, and you know it, as a shopper, when something, you want to buy something, you say, what do you say? Wait till it comes on sale, because you know it will come on sale. There's always a sale going on. And so this whole brand loyalty becomes brand switching and much more focused on prices. 
Here's an example of how trust can be eroded very quickly. So this was fipronol. Fipronol is a insecticide put on grains to prevent in insects eating the grains. Some of it got onto grains that were then fed to chickens that laid eggs. So two stages through the supply chain. Um, the mainstream media picked it up. Belgian and Dutch officials point fingers amid egg contamination scare. Fipronol egg scandal, what we know. Contaminated eggs. Netherlands failed to sound alarm, says Belgium. So in Europe, they were all about fipronol being on the eggs. Now, you'd have to eat like, you know, five truckloads of eggs to get any contamination effect on your body. But, you know, it was still out there. Anyways, Main Street Media picked it up, put it up. Nobody cared. Then internet Google searches happened and Facebook friends got hold of it. And we can see what happened. Nothing, nothing. And, and again, this is, this is where mainstream media was picking it up. Boop. All of a sudden, a flash. Everybody kind of retweeted it, resent it, liked it, whatever. And the, uh, all the retailers had to pull the eggs from the shelf. Same thing happened with finely textured beef or pink slime. Same thing. I was actually in the CEO's office of a large restaurant chain when they got the call from an activist and said, if you don't pull, or if you don't have a commitment to cage-free eggs within the next 48 hours, we're going we're to picket your stores. And guess what they did? They came up with a commitment. They had no idea what they were doing, but all of a sudden they had to have cage-free eggs. Again, the influence of our purchase of consumers versus, it wasn't a politician coming in and putting a regulation in place, it was consumers reacting to it. And so what we see from that is we now have food companies and grocery retailers are leveraging the free from brands, free from GMOs, free from gluten, free from artificial flavors, free from artificial colors, free by antibiotics, cage free. We're seeing free all over the place. In fact, I have a cartoon that says, shows a guy buying something that says no fat on it. And his wife says, what is it? And he says, I don't know what it is. I bought it for what it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so the free from movement is, is exploding in, in Europe, in North America, and I'm sure in Australia as well, as we're seeing more organic, more local, more all of these authentic types of products. And so the younger generation are actually looking for brands that do good. And so you see in Generation Z and Generation Millennials, Respondents looking for brands or retailers that do good for the world. Very high. Generation X less and boomers less. But that's the trend. I mean, again, look at the population in 10 years. These are the population. 3.5 billion or actually more than that. It's almost, uh, it's almost um, 5 billion people will be consumers that are going to be thinking this way. So if you're a brand manufacturer or retailer, you better be making sure you're aligned with these values as well as the value of your product. Because you have two, those two dichotomies. I'm not brand loyal, so I'm looking for price, but I want values in my product. So I want value and values at the same time, which is often difficult to navigate. And then what, but you're willing to pay in many cases for things that are socially responsible, environmentally responsible. So fresh foods and packaged foods, Generation Z, 83% are willing to pay more for environmentally friendly or socially minded brands. Packaged foods, 77 and 75 percent. Same is happening in apparel, personal care, automotive, footwear. So again, as a brand owner, and you have a socially an authentic, socially responsible or environmentally responsible product, you may be able to charge a premium. So price accordingly. You have to understand that. You have to understand the connection. You have to understand the consumers thinking about your product. But there is there is that uh, price premium that people are willing to pay. As a result of this, we just did a study, and this is based on uh, North American uh, food product companies, and, and, but uh, it, I think the same is here as well. We looked at the top 25 food and beverage companies and the top 25 personal care and beauty companies in the US. And we looked at the last three years. In the last three years, from 2012 to 2016, the top 25 companies had 66% share of the market. It dropped to 63% share. The top 25 personal care and beauty companies had 76 share and dropped to 72 percent share. The, their growth was 2 percent, the rest of the market's growth was 6 percent. Growth of 1 percent, rest was 8 percent. Just in food and beverage, top 25 food and beverage companies, and think about it, they're all the brand names you know, and the la in those three years lost collectively 15 billion dollars in market share. 
And who did they lose it to? They lost it to some to private label and retail, but private label and retail hasn't grown tremendously. They lost a lot to what we call the perimeter, the fresh aisles, produce, fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, dairy, bakery, deli, fresh meats, seafood, where people are shopping more around the outside of the store than the inside of the store. And they lost to all the startups and new players and innovators. Think of Chobani and yogurt, Hampton Creek and mayonnaise. Halo Top and ice cream. I know it's not in Australia yet, but you've got to find it. It's great. <laughs> um, and so the small startups, the innovators, the, the, the venture capital is throwing money at them. They're getting lots of uptick. And I can go through all the economics of scale. They also have the ability to get scale quickly. So this is a, a wake-up call for food and beverage companies. And if you look at any of them in the last 6, 8, 12 months, most of them have had flat growth, negative growth. They've got EBITDA margins up because all of them have had cost reduction programs, but they have no growth. And so now we're seeing as Generation Z is starting to take over from the millennials, you know, their influence versus affluence revolution. As I said, they're digital natives, digitally intuitive. They're tolerant, more tolerant than boomers for sure, but, but more tolerant even than General X, Generation X's as far as lifestyle. More responsible, responsible and entrepreneurial kind of go together. Why? They grew up during the Great Recession of 2008. They saw their parents' <laughs> parents' net worth go, you know, drop by 30 percent. They saw millennials not being able to get jobs when they graduated. So they're saying, "Heck, that! I'm going to try to. I'm going to stand up for myself." And so much more responsible and entrepreneurial, self-educated as well. Online courses now, you know, realizing that going to college is not necessarily a ticket to a better lifestyle, and community-minded, working with communities, working and helping. So here's, you know, this is even more change coming up with the next generation beyond millennials. I'm going to go a little video now just to kind of give you a bit of context to it. I'm famous with local brands because by local brands actually you have the flavor and the variety of every different state. And many of you <laughs> So that kind of gives you a taste. That's just Generation Z. We've, and again, we've collected a whole series of uh, street interviews that take even further that depth of brand loyalty, the influence, trust, etc. So let's talk influence. Jeff Bezos, CEO of a Amazon. I know Amazon's coming to Australia. Um, and his comment was, if you make customers unhappy in the physical world, they may tell six friends. If you make customers unhappy in the internet, they will tell 6,000. That example of Fipronol, boop, boop. The thousand-fold increase in bad reputation is, is, is really a focus on most brand companies now because they know they can't screw up, which is interesting because it's also preventing them from innovating. Because if I take the safe road, I'm not going to try something innovative. And so the, that's even giving more fuel to the startups and everyone else who are coming up with more innovative products. So influence has now become the key aspect rather than, as we showed before, marketing and brand persuasion. Let's talk a bit about the event that shocked the industry, Amazon buying Whole Foods in the United States. It happened on August 28th. You know, why would they buy the retail store in Whole Foods, which was kind of struggling a bit? Well, Amazon didn't buy Whole Foods for retail stores. <coughs> Amazon bought Whole Foods for 450 local distribution centers. Amazon has a, what's called Amazon Go. They want to have a, they've actually moved now to a one-day delivery. So order one day, get delivered the next. And they're moving to a 30-minute delivery using an Amazon type of model. It's, you know, I want to cheese. I want to look at the prepared foods. So that it's inside of the store now can be um, 
reconfigured to really start to ship and do what they call click and collect. I order the stuff online, my subscription, I know my toothpaste, my toilet paper, my deodorant, and I just go pick it up in the store. It's packaged for me right there, and I take it when I buy my seafood and my bakery items. So that's one aspect of it. Second aspect is they, they want the loyalty data. They've got, if you look at the Amazon Prime membership, which is their premier membership, and you look at the Whole Food customer, they're very well aligned to each other. And so you noticed on day one of Amazon taking over uh, Whole Foods, they dropped the price on something like 50 to 75 items. Now these weren't random items, they weren't just like, oh, let's drop banana prices. They dropped very specific items and they generated a 25% increase in foot traffic to Whole Foods. So how did they pick the items? They were using deep analytics, uh, analytical um, predictive uh, modeling, and artificial intelligence to really say what are the products that have the affinity to other products that are going to bring people in the stores that meet the Amazon Prime uh, aspects and pull all those pieces together. It was a very precise pricing strategy and one that I would guarantee no other physical in, uh, retailer has the information on, but Amazon has it on you because we shop there, we, we like things, they know our, our sales record, they know a lot of things. So this event shocked the industry. The pundits are saying this is the first shoe to drop of a centipede. Um, because Amazon with 450 stores is not enough for them to fulfill a 30 minute delivery across the United States. They're going to have to buy two more retail chains to get that. Interesting part is if you look at Alibaba, they've just bought some physical stores in China as well. So this physical digital, which all the physical retailers have had trouble with over the last decade, is now reversing itself. And so we're, we're very closely watching Amazon. In fact, you know, a lot of our clients in, in North America and Canada and Europe are very, very interested in what the evolution of this will be. Connectivity is part of it. So if we look at it, generations of approach, connectivity, percentage of respondents who are constantly or sporadically connected. Generation Z, 65% of the time they're online. I mean, they're always online. So it's always on their phone, always on Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, Twitter, um, not LinkedIn yet. Thank goodness, but that's okay. <laughs> um, millennials, 60% of the time, you know, and then uh, X, 52, and then boomers, you know, when they uh, charge up their, uh, their uh, modems, you know, get going at, at the <laughs> summer, so. I'm a boomer, I can make these jokes, okay? <laughs> I remember the first 300 baud modems where you had to put the telephone handset into them, so uh, that, that really dates me. So. Um, but so that this constant connectivity is making this accelerate even further. And so we look at Asian consumers, you know, buying groceries online. 63% of China consumers buy groceries online. That's amazing. I mean, we're looking at, you know, Germany, France, U.S. are way down here. And in fact, in the U.S. it's still like, ah, people aren't going to buy online. They want to go to the store. They want to go pick up the milk themselves, you know. And, but we're seeing that absolute that leapfrogging in China, India, and Japan of technology. You know, online ordering is, about, is, is much better ordering. In fact, what's that? Um, probably because of the lack of modern retail trade in, uh, in China and India. It's always been traditional trade, wet markets, spice markets, fruit and vegetable markets, which by the way in India are now coming back into vogue. Um, but uh, it's just more convenient, it's easier. You know, large cities don't have all the retail establishments they want. You can order anything you want online. And we'll get into Alibaba in a second and how they're making it easier to buy that online. So, interesting effect, restaurants are being hammered because of two things, Amazon and Netflix. <laughs> and why? People used to go out to the theater, watch a movie, and then go out and have a dinner or have a, you know, a meal. Now they're sitting at home with Netflix. People used to go to shopping and bought their clothing or whatever, electronics, and then go out to dinner. Now they're ordering it on Amazon. So retailers are rethinking, how do I get people off the couch? So how do I make, as we call it, stores with stories? How do I start making the stores become more places and destinations? Not to buy things, but to just go. Community centers, entertainment, what is it I need to do to get people into the stores? And restaurants are trying to promote that as well. So it's Alibaba. So, you know, Alibaba is focused on 900 million millennials in China. <laughs> Let's sink in. 900 million millennials. 
and a majority of its buyers, 30% of its merchants. Alibaba has a different business model than Amazon. Amazon is what's called an asset heavy model. It's, you know, they buy distribution centers, they buy trucks, they ship out, they basically, they're the, the vendor to, to you. Alibaba is more like an eBay model where traders sell to you, they're the intermediary, they don't own warehouses, they don't own trucks, they, everything is outsourced. Interesting statistic. Amazon is twice, as five times the revenue of Alibaba, 135 billion versus 30 billion or something like that. But Alibaba has twice the EBIT, the earnings before interest and trade, uh, than, uh, and tax than, um, than uh, Amazon does. So Alibaba's twice as profitable, yet five times less revenue. Interesting how this is gonna, so the fight, the fight, the conflict, the conflict, the, the interaction between Alibaba and Amazon is gonna define our future e-commerce world and the two models. Alibaba has what is also a continuous scale model. If you have, you want to sell something, you can put it on Alibaba. They will help you get the image up. They will help you price it. They will help you market it. They will say, this is the demographic of people you should go after. Here's the, here's the time of day you should sell it. They've got all the artificial intelligence and, and activity to do it. And then if you go from selling one product to selling 100 products to selling 1,000 products to selling a million products, they have the continuous scale from taking it from going through your house in the post office, to bundling it up and going to a courier, to putting it into a distribution warehouse, to filling aisles in a distribution warehouse, to having your own trucks. They have that ability. So that scale up is critical to Alibaba's success, which means that a lot of new vendors can come into play that have never been in the, in the marketplace before. While Amazon shocked the world, Alibaba is changing it. I'm just gonna show you statistics of one day sales. So, Black Friday, which in the U.S. is sort of the big retail day. It's the day after Thanksgiving. Everybody goes out because they, they, they want to go and buy stuff for some reason. Mostly they're buying it for Christmas gifts, but uh, it's $3.3 billion in sales. Amazon has a Prime Day, which is like their event day, and it sold $1 billion in sales. And they got Cyber Monday, which is a kind of an internet thing that just started up. Anyways, Alibaba has what's called Singles Day. Last year, Singles Day, $17.8 billion in sales. So the, the scale difference is immense between the two. Amazon's biggest competitor is not Walmart. It's not the other physical, it's Alibaba. And that's why they're probably coming into Australia, so Alibaba doesn't get too much of a foothold here as well. So what do they do that's different? Predictive fulfillment analytics. They know, because they've gathering all this data, they know you know, on a Tuesday, I need this much inventory in this forward deployment area. And on a Friday, I need this much inventory of this product in that deployment area. They've got artificial intelligence working, and machine learning, mobile orders and payments, personalization, robotics and consumer technology. They're using technologies in ways that have never been used in retail before. Um, and, are, and are plowing more and more money into technology innovations. And are, and are getting to a level of predictive analytics, big data analytics, and precision that just has not been seen before. Which, which will spell trouble for a lot of brands because they will call, I mean a lot of brands have always been there because they got shelf space. Well, unless you're selling and have the right price point and consumer demand, you're not gonna get any shelf space. So I think this is gonna be an interesting model again as we follow it through. Part of it is micro-targeting. So we take big data, we know a lot of information about each of us. Then we take psychographics, personality, values, interests, lifestyles, age, gender, race, location, employment status, get micro-targeting. So we've all grown up saying, okay, we segment based on age, you know, we want 18 to, to 35 year olds, gender, male or female, income, are they earning 25 to dollars $50,000, the old demographic data. Although they're using that as a base, that's not what they're using. They're, they're analyzing things like your sleep pattern, what you eat, how often you go to the store, where are you located on a Tuesday afternoon. How do they get this information? How many of you are using sleep apps right now with your iPhone that help you that monitor your sleep? Several of you. How many of you are using any type of a diet model or a weight or a fitness app or a Fitbit? All this information is being collected. And so this information in micro-targeting is, is sort of the key to a lot of the things that they're doing. Here's kind of a, this influencer model as we, we take it even further. Um, 
used to be that, again, the influence was based on brands, it was based on, on, uh, on uh, you know, big marketing budgets. But here we have the paradox of communication in the digital age. On one hand, there is no more com commonly agreed upon experts, as I mentioned before, you know, the lack of trust. But at the same time, everyone or anyone with a platform can be perceived as an expert in any given issue. So here's this woman, Laura Vitale. You know, she's a dietitian? No. She's a chef? No. She's a person, and she likes to cook. And so she went on and started showing her mother's Italian recipes. She has 2.8 million subscribers on YouTube. She is influencing what people buy to make their dinner. And that influence from her is, is I mean, astounding. It's, again, something that we've not seen before. It used to be the experts. Remember when dietitians and nutritionists said what we should eat? Remember when margarine was good and butter was bad? <laughs> Remember when eggs were bad and now they're good? Remember when low-fat, no-fat food didn't make you fat? And remember when diet colas were good for you? Our nutritional science has gone up on its head, and people don't believe nutritionists and dietitians, which is a problem for grocery stores and food manufacturers right now, is where do we get the authority figures? Are these the new authority figures? So those influencers, those micro-influencers, become very important. So I'm going to take that thing about big data and influence and trust and talk now about personalization. And, and so Marissa Meyer, who is the CEO of Yahoo, I mean, said, the future to me is personalization. And this is what's driving Alibaba. This is what's driving Amazon. Retailers are understanding it more and more now. And so we're seeing this being accelerated. So personalization requires companies to act on the notion of consumers as a data feed. Email, text, travel, shopping, history, and browsing, what you do, and who you are, diet, fitness, finances, social influence, sleep patterns. As I mentioned, there's a lot of information available now because of all these great apps that you're getting for free. Nothing is free. <laughs> Whenever you download an app that doesn't cost you any money, it costs you in other ways. And so we're trying. So think about it. Again, any, any boomers in the room or older um, X generation, if I said 15 years ago, the government's going to put something in your pocket that will track you every day, uh, where you are, what you're doing, and monitor your communications. You'd go, no way, can't be done. Now we do it gladly. And it all comes down to what is the benefit of giving up information. And uh, that, that's going to be the, the key prospect of it. So if we look at that, respondents willing to share data if they get something in return. China, 45%. Back, Rinko, to your point, why is China so much on to online? Because they're willing to share information and get better personalization back. You know, USA is at 41%, you know, and Germany probably the most skeptical at 33%. But we're seeing that I'm willing to give up information if I get something in return. And so I'm giving up my sleep pattern because I'm getting the sleep app. And I'm giving up my diet and fitness regimen because, hey, I get some prompting and, and motivation. And, and those things that are... You know, here's, here's an example of tracking caloric intake. So, you know, Fat Secret, 45 million users. My Fitness Pal, 165 million users. Lose It, 30 million users. You know, all of these things are tracking what we eat, when we eat, how we exercise, when we exercise, and it's all going into a collective cloud, and that's giving us information on each one of us personally. In fact, right now, there's 5,200 gigabytes of data on each one of us in the room. And that's going to several three to four terabytes of information. The amount of information that's collected on each one of us is immense. M many of it because it, it follows the cookies as you go from one site to another. Just we have no idea of the type of information. And this is collectively giving a better perspective for companies to target and personalize to you versus you versus you. Here's an example, Coca-Cola, and, and may have seen this as well, where they set up a program where they would, you type in your name and they'd send you bottles of Coca-Cola with your name on it. We got, uh, you know, they increased the U.S. sales by more than 2%. They had 25 million additional Facebook followers. A thousand names were generated. Some of them not appropriate, by the way. <laughs> but, I mean, a great program that, that kind of personalized a very commodity object. Right now, we're seeing personalization take technology. So Amazon has what they call the dash, which is a little button. 
Simple button. You put it into your home, you connect it to your Wi-Fi system. If you're using a wash and you, and you run out of Tide, you press the button, it automatically orders Tide and you'll get it delivered within one to two days. Same thing for toothpaste, toilet paper, whatever you want. You can get these little buttons. I mean, they're going to be replaced very quickly because now we have the Alexa, or the personal assistant, which is a voice-activated system, where I just say, Alexa, I need more Tide. Automatically knows your Amazon account, connects in, gets you going. And, and you can actually put it on a subscription model. So I can do a subscription model that tells, you know, knows when I run out of toothpaste and will automatically send me more toothpaste. So think about it. The grocery store with the perimeter of fresh bakery, deli, meat, seafood, dairy, and the center with packaged goods and cereals and, and canned soup and everything, that center is going away. That center is going to be replaced by these. That center is going to go onto the cloud. It's going to be a subscription model. It's going to be voice activated. It's going to be a push button. And the other thing about Alexa, Alexa only responds when you say, Alexa, Alexa, what's the weather like? But Alexa has to be listening to hear the word Alexa. So what else is it listening to? Amazon guarantees it's not listening to our private conversations. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so the amount of personal information is becoming more and more intense. So let's put all that together and look at what the new food consumer looks like. And tell me how many of these you are part of. Actively seeking information. I'm looking for free from. I'm looking for ingredients on the packaging. I not only want to know what it is, I want to know where it came from and how it was made. Those are all the information that we're seeking. Trust their friends more than their ads. Facebook friends are my, uh, you know, I talked about dietitians and nutritionists. Now where do I go for dietary advice? My Facebook friends. Or I go to, to the uh, Laura Vitale and, and her YouTube videos. Product with purpose. Products have to have a purpose. As we saw, our vote, we, by our purchase decisions, we have more influence on society than with our voting decisions. So products have to have a purpose. Products have to have some values that they transcribe. Stores with stories. So a store has to have more than just selling product. It has to have a reason for you to come in because I can sit on my couch and watch Netflix and order things on Amazon. So what's going to cause you to come into my store? So stores with stories, product with purpose are very important aspects. And then finally, the, the kind of the negative on it, a rejection of big ag and big food. We're seeing a rejection of the big industrial farmer with fertilizers and, and insecticides and fungicides. And more of this kind of uh, back to, oh, the, the rural farmer with the rolling green hills and, and the smiling cattle and things like that. So you know, farmers markets are, are increasing dramatically. Um, this farm to table movement is moving across. The whole, the whole Alice Waters and the good food movement is resurged. It was, it was big in the 60s and 70s when the hippies had it, but hippies didn't have social media. So now it's come back again in the good food movement, which is all around natural products, organic, and all those things are really seeing a, a big increase. So this new food consumer is really causing the challenge to our ag food industrial complex. <laughs> which is our brand manufacturers. And so this is a real challenge that many of them are facing. So what do you do? So I'm just going to take the last few minutes to talk about things that, that companies need to think about in order to get ahead of some of these triggers that are going to occur. First is invest big in customer intimacy. If consumer data is the only asset that's important to you, your factories, assets, your marketing assets, your truck assets are less than consumer data and consumer intimacy. So learn enough through direct to consumer. Can you get more closely to the consumer? Do like Coca-Cola. Coke doesn't sell direct to consumers, but they did through that personalization um, marketing ad. Treat data as a prized asset. It is the prized asset. It's probably your most prized asset. And relentlessly tailored to needs because they're going to change. Consumers are going to change. Adopt consumer segmentation models as complex cohorts emerge. So the segmentation has always been, again, age segmentation, income segmentation, location segmentation. Now I've got a segmentation on people that don't sleep well at night, or people that, that exercise more than average, or people that eat five meals a day instead of three meals a day. So I will find this, so I, I need to move to the individual, use advanced techniques, again, data analytics, um, precision analytics, predictive modeling, and refine your view of consumer cohorts. They're not just, so treating millennials as one 
homogeneous mass is wrong, even though I have in the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Just for purposes of illustration. Um, no, you really need to get beyond that to really start to look at that micro-segmentation. Adjust marketing budgets to reflect the new social media realities. Optimize the mix at the cohort level, redefine efficiency, and learn to sprint. Now here's an interesting dilemma. dilemma. Um, digital marketing, which is always the buzzword, you know, looking at putting in banner ads and, and pop-up videos and all the other things that irritate each one of us. Uh, Procter & Gamble, the, probably the biggest advertiser in the world, the most sophisticated advertiser in the world, uh, just took out 50%, $100 million out of their digital ad spending, saying it was totally ineffective. They're used to doing 30-second ads. They were pushed to doing 15-second ads. How many of you, if you pop up a video of your favorite artist or a clip from a, from a TV show, want to watch a 15-second ad before it goes on? How many are pressing skip like five times? <laughs> They're realizing that their whole marketing model they have to get down to a two-second ad. How do I promote Tide with two seconds? And that's the reality of digital marketing now, is people are not willing to just have something pushed at them. If I want to go see about Tide for 30 seconds, I will. But don't push it at me. And so that's, and, and, and face it, with Netflix and cable television, you know, traditional advertising television is also on the downward slide. Engage micro-influencers to build authentic community. So systematize influencer usage, seek quality, not quantity, build ambassadorship, like we had with Laura Vitale. Find those people that are passionate, not about your product, but about how your product is used, a product with purpose. And find ways of engaging them. So I deal with a lot with startups, and I, I find the startups and their view on marketing totally refreshing. They start off, they create a product, they, get, they build it in their kitchen. Then what they do is they throw a party and get a bunch of friends to try it. The friends like it. The friends go and tell their friends and have parties and, and it goes that way. Then they go, and they go to a farmer's market and put up a little stall and they get people engaged in that and they get Facebook um, and, and uh, Instagram uh, feeds going on it and they get comments going, et cetera. And then they, then they go to a retailer and say, hey, I've got this much Instagram and I've got this much Facebook followings and this is the product and here's the reviews. Would you like to try it in one of your stores? And then they go in and do store demonstrations. I mean, the passion and it's all grassroots and it's bottom up and it's working well. So it's a different approach to marketing. Rather than coming up with a brand strategy, spending you know, six months with my advertising agency and launching commercials on Super Bowl. It's a different approach entirely. Build trust with sharper value propositions. Mirror ethical concerns, product with purpose. Let them in. Have people help, you know, have consumers help design your products, help design your experiences and take the pricing opportunities. If locally sourced and sustainable are, could actually, people pay more for them, then let them, okay? So look at the pricing opportunities as well. So the Asia Pacific region has some unique peculiarities, some unique influence that I think I just want to end with. The demographics, massive population of young consumers. In comparison to uh, Europe and North America, a lot younger population than India, China, Southeast Asia. And so that changes the demographics. And we saw they're more, and they're as well, you know, preference for brands that offer personalization. So they, they like brands, but they also want more personalization and willing to give information up for personalization and hyper connectivity. They're more connected than any other consumers around the world. So use that in your advantage because that's how you're going to define your branding strategy, your product strategy, product with purpose, stores with stories. As you, as you go forward um, in the consumer world. Thank you very much, and I open up to any questions. <laughs> How do I do on time? Yes, sir. Have we uh, looked at all at uh, the movement of manufacturing to the couch uh, and uh, additive manufacture and total personalization type stuff? Well, I think in, in, uh, from a food perspective, um, yeah, so like 3D printing and things like that, um, you know, 3D printing was always getting a pile of dough and making it yourself, I guess. So. But yeah, so I think manufacturing in the food perspective, additive manufacturing and personalized manufacturing for apparel and automotive and electronics is definitely there. In food, um, you've always had to sort of do it in your kitchen and then scale it up. 
Uh, but we're seeing some new technologies coming into food, things like uh, sous vide technology, which has been around for 30 years, but is now making a comeback, which is under vacuum, allows you to cook a product. Um, but you know, think of a slow cooker. You put it in at 130, put a steak in a vacuum pack, put it into a, a pot that keeps 130 degrees temperature. It'll keep that steak for the next 12 hours at medium rare. And then you take it out, put it on the grill one side, put it on the grill the other side, you've got a steak. Every major steak restaurant is using this now. We've got things like HPP, high pressure pasteurization. I no longer have to pasteurize product, which basically gets rid of the bugs, by using heat, which has always been used for like canned soup, or using chemicals, which have been used for preservatives. I use 55,000 pounds per square inch pressure, and it kills the bugs. And so there's new technologies coming out in food processing that I think are going to have a dramatic effect as well. Absolutely. Yes? Um, what are the Yep. And a lot of the charts, like a lot of the charts across the country, have actually lost five and other sort of third-party parties going back to get upstream on that statistic. Uh, so it depends on how you define online purchase. Is it yeah. purchase once, purchase you know once a month, purchase once a week, purchase every day? Correct. So so I'll tell you now, the data on online purchases is muddled at best. Yeah. So. Uh, and it depends, because I think you'll see 80% of people shop online. It means that 80% of people have tried shopping online. Yeah. It's a different, different statistic. Yeah, sir. I think you tried to compare Amazon and Alibaba. Yeah. But the other markets will actually directly compete with each other, because if you look at China, Alibaba is a really big player, but Amazon has like two percent share. Yeah. In a market where Amazon is really like US or the world, Alibaba is maybe big. Um, there's, I mean, there's, there's pockets. Alibaba is opening up a distribution center in Detroit, <laughs> so it's going to be interesting. Um, not, they're not like direct, you know, equal size. It's either Alibaba's really big and Amazon's small, or Amazon's really big and Alibaba's really small. So, but I think in the next three years, we're going to start to see certain geographies where that, that you know, I think the U.S. is a, is a uh, proper market that'll happen. Alibaba will want to get into the U.S. I think, uh, you know, what's going to happen in, in, uh, in Japan, uh, India, I mean China, a Amazon's tried but not been able to failure. Europe is another open area, so I don't know. That's good. You have a view that Amazon come to Australia um, with a potential precedent in a similar market like Canada or something like that, where what you predict will happen. <coughs> uh, I mean, we can you know we can mimic. I mean, you can look at what happened to Amazon. I mean, Amazon came in; it had a long, slow ramp up. Amazon's been in U.S. and Canada for many, many, many years, but then it had an uptick. So there's kind of like three or four phases. So the first phase is people experimenting and trying and they do a bit of there and of that. Then you start to see whole categories shift over to Amazon. So you're seeing things like books were the first ones to go, okay? And so the big booksellers like Barnes and Noble and Borders went out of business. Um, electronics tend to go. Uh, apparel was always slow to go because, um, you know, I gotta try it on first and things like that, but you're finding shoes going on fast. Uh, you're finding a lot of um, you know, personal things like hand creams and deodorants and soaps and stuff like going on. So there's, it'll shift by category. But then you've got, so that goes and then you'll see that as Amazon gets more and more share and, and the stores and the retailers that were selling those products that were undifferentiated do one of two things. They either go out of business like Toys R Us or they develop more private labels so they can't be replicated on Amazon. So there's, there's those types of things. The second phase, the third phase, which I'm finding most interesting, is the resurgence of the independent bookstores. Independent bookstores are rising up in the U.S. again. Independent butchers are rising up. Guess what? One of the fastest growing trades right now, bartenders, because people have all of the, and what it comes down to is a combination of things. One is we have too much choice. You ever go into a grocery store and look at mustard? There's 400 different types of mustard. What do I do now? So curation is becoming an interesting thing. So we're seeing small independent bookstores coming up. So I'm not going to buy the, the bestseller, but I want to look for a very unique you know, mystery fiction. The bookseller helps me there. The other ones going up is travel agents are actually seeing an expansion as well. Not to buy your plane tickets. I can buy those cheap anyway. But help me to put together a great vacation in, in, uh, in Vietnam or, or in, in France or something like that. So, it's on a smaller scale, but we're seeing that independent curation coming up. I'll give you an example. We did some work for a retailer on their whole meat category. And they had butchers in the back of the store cutting up the meat, dun, 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 make steaks, make chops, make hamburgers, da, 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 put it into trays, put the cellophane on it. Do you think a lot of that is the millennial sort of being brought up by boomers who, at least in the West, you had that sort of question of authority period from the 60s to 
yeah. in the late seventies, and then that's just been now applied by the millennials to the consumer market rather than the political side of things. Well, I think the trust is is multiple. One is there is a belief that we were sold a bill of goods. So we were told that these products were healthy and then we found out they weren't healthy. We were told that these chemicals won't harm us and now we believe they do. So there's, there's a bit of that 60s hippie stuff about organic and back to the earth and everything else now accelerated and amplified with social media and information. So I think those two together come together. I mean, there's always an undercurrent. There's always been a, there's always been a, a, a Michael Pollan and an Alice Walters, Waters and, uh, you know, and, and Marion Nestle, but now they have an amplification. Yeah. Sorry, uh, it's nine o'clock, guys. I know I did see a few people sneaking out the back. I don't know if people have got uh, work to go to, unfortunately, but uh, <laughs> those will be around the coffee carts there, grab some food on the way out. But um, thank you all for coming. Well, thank you. Thank you. Good.